Hello and welcome back to Cooking the Books with Jilly Smith, the podcast which takes us through four moments from the books of our favourite A-lister writers. But just before we dive back into the world of food, we're going back to WOMAD, to the world of Words Tent, where this summer I chatted to welcome prize-winning neurologist Susanna O'Sullivan about her astonishing book, Sleeping Beauties. These children are in terribly difficult situations and what happens to them is they just become very very listless and quiet in the first instance and then they just gradually kind of withdraw from society stop going to school stop talking and then they lie in their beds and then they stop communicating and it's all that takes you know a long period then they just close their eyes and they stop moving and I saw these little girls and like the dad picked up one of the girls and she was literally like a little rag doll. She was just a, a floppy thing in his hands. The book is her investigation of mystery illnesses, a wave of mass hysteria in communities across the world. Terrifyingly, it's affecting a growing number of people, usually children or adolescents and mostly girls who've lost hope for all sorts of sociopolitical reasons. From Cuba to Kazakhstan, Guyana, to the most famous Swedish asylum-seeking girls who've been asleep for years, Susanna explores how powerfully the body can communicate distress when no one's listening. This is a trip into the human psyche via misogyny, cultural imperialism, and more than a little voodoo, and not a single mention food. December 2017 I picked up, uh, I saw a, a headline on the computer that said Sweden's mystery illness and I read through the article and it was about hundreds and hundreds of children living in Sweden who basically had fallen into this coma like state that lasted for months and sometimes years at a time. These were kids as young as seven who were basically becoming listless taking to their beds and then remaining completely unresponsive for a phenomenal amount of time. Needless to say, I read through the article and I discovered that mystery wasn't quite as mysterious as the headline was suggesting. That these children had something very specific about them that let you know a lot more of, of the answers to the mystery. And that these were all asylum-seeking children seeking, who had come from terrible places where they had terrible lives. They were seeking asylum in Sweden and they were facing potential deportation. So kind of having heard that, I, I deal with people in comas all the time for both organic brain reasons and psychological reasons. I went and visited those children and it was just deeply, deeply moving and upsetting. Imagine walking into a room of a couple of girls, one of them's 10 years old, one of them's 11, and they just look like they're asleep, but five people walk into their room and a dog and they don't even bat an eyelid, nothing happens. They just look super healthy, except they're wearing nappies because they never ever move. And they've got nasogastric tubes because they don't eat. And they just lie as if they were asleep the whole time, being kept alive with physiotherapy and things like that just to keep them mobile. It's the most upsetting thing you can imagine. And these little girls that I visited had been like that for over a year. But the thing that led to this book was the conversation that I had about these girls with the doctor who facilitated my visit. So I'm a neurologist and I'm supposed to understand everything about how the brain works. I wish I did. But, you know, in the conversation with that doctor, she wanted one thing from me and one thing only. And that was, please tell me what is going on in these girls' brains to keep them in this situation. And I just kept thinking, but we know why they're in this situation. Okay, I don't understand all the biochemistry or the neurotransmitter that's doing it, but every one of these children has been traumatized and is facing deportation. That is what we should be talking about. Um, because, you know, yes, it's all very interesting to a neuroscientist to understand the chemical processes that are keeping them like that. But maybe we should understand that after we've solved the actual problem which is that these kids are in a terrible social situation and that's what they need help with. And Suzanne, that, just before you go on there, let's just paint a picture of these girls. You, they're lying in their mm. beds. Uh, their family take them through the routines of yeah. the day. They try to keep them within the family. Yeah. But let's be really clear. These girls uh, were taken from, from where? where? Where did they come from? So these children, they... Quite a lot of them are come from sort of the sort of minorities like Uyghur Muslims, for example, minorities that have been, you know, extremely persecuted. They're coming from places like Syria, they're coming from war and tour countries, and they're coming from specific kind of minority groups that tend to be persecuted. Um, they've travelled very difficult routes to get to Sweden. 
And Sweden is, if you're, you know, as an asylum-seeking person, a wonderful place to be because Sweden has, was certainly at that time very, very accommodating to them, allowed them to stay. These children arrive, say, at the age of three or four or younger, and they, they're immediately schooled in Sweden. They're given homes. So and they're speaking, in, uh, speaking yeah, Swedish. speaking Swedish. And speaking, speaking Swedish for the family, crucially. Absolutely. They are sort of... The children are s- s- fundamentally Swedish, but the parents still don't necessarily speak Swedish and they have a different culture to the children. So the children have a big responsibility. Also, the asylum-seeking process in Sweden, it goes through three stages. You can apply, get turned down, apply again, get turned down, you can apply again. That, takes, that could take 10 years. Um, so you arrive at the age of three. By the time these children are potentially being asked to leave Sweden, they're 10 or they're 15 or they're 13 years old and they've never known anything but living in Sweden. They're also the translators for their families. So they're very often the people who pick up the letter that says, you have to go to this tribunal, etc. So these children are in terribly difficult situations. And what happens to them is they just become very, very listless and quiet in the first instance, and then they just gradually kind of withdraw from society, stop going to school, stop talking, then they lie in their beds, and then they stop communicating, and it's all, that takes you know, a long period. Then they just close their eyes and they stop moving. And I saw these little girls, and like the dad picked up one of the girls, and she was literally like a little rag doll. She was just a, a floppy thing in his hands. And, um, it is such eyes. an articulate expression of despair. Mm. It's the, you, you're talking in particular in that particular chapter about mm. two sisters. Yeah. But how many Swedish children are there who have yeah. fallen asleep? I mean, there are hundreds. You know, between 2005 and um, I think, oh, I always forget my dates. It was like 224 or so. So there was a couple of hundred, but there have been more since. What's more, it began in Sweden, but it has spread to um, asylum seekers in Greece and also in Nauru, which was an island off Australia where asylum seekers were housed, much like our kind of Rwanda situation now, really. And Um, it's increasing. Yeah. Um, It's called resignation syndrome. Yeah. Which means giving up. Yeah. As, as a doctor, I actually work uh, full-time for the NHS, and I see people who lose consciousness for purely kind of psychosocial reasons, stress-related reasons, all the time. It's so common. It's so common that, you know, if I have an epilepsy clinic, so if I a clinic where people lose consciousness due to epilepsy, which is a brain disease, if I see 10 people in that clinic three of them will lose consciousness for purely psychosomatic reasons. So it's so common. But what's not common and what's unprecedented with these children is that they stay in this state for like 18 months or years. I also met on my trip to Sweden a couple of girls who, you know, they they fell into it when they were sort of pre-pubertal, sort of 11, 12. And I met them when they were like 16 and they'd been like that. They were going through puberty in a state of just lying in bed doing nothing. It was terribly shocking. And developing acne and their bodies developing over years. It's really quite extraordinary. This sets you on a journey to try and find out more about this, which literally took you all over the world. And we literally don't have time here to follow the journey. It is quite extraordinary. It's an amazing read. Um, and And you put the pieces together you don't come out with an absolute answer but in a sense you you're right you say you know we kind of know what this is about this is an articulation of distress tell us about your second moment where you get to Havana yeah so um I didn't visit Havana for this story I I wish I had um but basically so just so if anyone doesn't know the story of Havana syndrome December 2016 I'll just give you a quick whistle stop tour through it U.S embassy opens in um, Havana after many years of closure. Very stressful reopening of the embassy. Uh, December 2016, people connected to the embassy, um, US diplomats, began hearing noises that they felt were suspicious and threatening. And that led to a group of people, US diplomats working in the US embassy in Havana, developing a thing called Havana syndrome, which is basically they get dizziness and brain fog and ringing in their ears and forgetfulness and headaches and unsteadiness and all those sort of symptoms. And it began with sort of one diplomat who felt sick, said they'd heard a noise the night before, thought they'd been attacked by something. Someone said, OK, you heard a noise, you're feeling sick, you must have been attacked by a sound weapon, which seems to me perhaps a, a slightly odd um, jump. However, 
it might seem odd to us, but if you're a diplomat in the US, and I believe that, you know, there's a lot of weird covert things happen sort of in... in um, if you, if you live in these circles, people do try to unsettle you. So it might seem weird to us, but for someone to, in that situation to believe they were under attack was actually kind of reasonable. Um, but that person then obviously communicated their fear they'd been attacked by a sonic weapon to other people. That fear spread around the US embassy in Havana until sort of, you know, in a year, I think something like 17 people had developed these constellation of non-specific symptoms which they attributed to being attacked by a sound weapon and that later spread around the world and it's an astonishing it, story it is and it's about a group experience mm. and you know going through history we know what group experiences are it's it's still a, a called a mystery illness yeah. i mean you say it's, it's, you want to really explore a more modern understanding of how psychosomatic symptoms are generated. What yep. did you find from this okay. one? Well, let's say that... So what I thought was most interesting about this... Well, let's first of all just talk about, for, you know, do I believe that people in US embassies could have been attacked by something? Absolutely. What do I know about espionage and diplomats? Absolutely nothing. Entirely possible. Um, but I also know this. Sound doesn't damage the brain. doesn't matter you know, how many ways you look at it, the sound doesn't damage the brain. And it's, it's a kind of a, what I think of as a sort of a folk belief. We've got this sort of belief that because sound enters through your ear, that it will damage your brain. Well, you know what? Sound waves, you know, if you're in an explosion and there's, you know, energy waves of that sort, they don't go straight for your brain. Sound gets to your brain through nerves, just like everything else. You know, it just makes no medical sense. It makes no sense whatsoever to have a sonic weapon. However, there are phenomenal number of people in the US, doctors and scientists and other people who are still believe that it, these people have been attacked by a sound weapon. Whereas, you know, as a doctor who works with psychosomatic illnesses, I can tell you these symptoms are absolutely typical of the kind of symptoms you get if you're under high pressure environment, you're being asked to examine your body, you're being told someone's attacking you and these are the symptoms. Do you have any of them? Well, what's the first thing you do is go, oh my God, I think I do have some. And then what happens is that that sort of group phenomenon that then spreads because you might say to me, well, a typical symptom of a sonic weapon attack is you get a headache. Well, I had a headache this morning. It was probably the cider that I drank last night, but let's put that aside for a moment. Um, but then I say, but you know, I don't just have a headache. I've actually got a bit of numbness in my foot. Now I've just added to the symptom pool of Havana syndrome. So anyone here who's got numbness in their foot can join me in the diagnosis. How many people are going? And oh, then, yeah. you know, basically then, and you'll have something that will invite other people into the group. So what happened in Havana syndrome is absolutely typical of, of people under pressure. But what was most interesting is that the doctors who were dealing with these people presented this kind of more psychosomatic or mind-body interaction phenomenon to these people as faking. They pretty much said, either you've been attacked by a sonic weapon or you're the best actor in the world. Well, if you're calling someone an actor, you're saying they're pretending to be sick. Or they say, either you've been attacked by a sonic weapon or you're weak and fragile and vulnerable and a bit of a fool. So if you're, if you're feeling genuinely ill, as these people were feeling, and these are the options you're given, well, why would, I, why would I not choose the sonic weapon? Because you're pretty much telling me I'm faking illness if I haven't been attacked by a sonic weapon. And what this outbreak really said to me is we need a better way of talking about mind-body interactions that doesn't make it sound like you're an, a, an idiot if you have it. Because mind-body interactions are normal. You know, you can tell if I'm happy, if I'm sad. Look at the way my hands are moving when I'm emphasizing. We don't, we, our minds and our bodies are connected. You can't, you, when you feel an emotion, you feel it in your body. If you're feeling confident, you can see it in your body. But unfortunately, sort of these doctors who were sort of very, um, you know, focused on sort of only brain injury is a legitimate illness did not allow these people to consider the alternatives. And the consequence of that is that these people are still having brain scan after brain scan after brain scan, looking for a, a solution that doesn't mean that they're faking illness. And that sort of expert analysis is the kind of the narrative through the book. Mm -hmm. How, what does that say to you about what was happening with the Swedish kids? 
I mean, it's it's the same situation over and over again, which is we don't we we need people to have a disease for us to respect their suffering. You know, you can't um, you know to to feel stressed or depressed or unwell in a more psychological way is is not given the same amount of time or consideration or sort of sympathy and the same amount of medical attention or the same amount of social support is not given to that if you've got a brain injury or a you know some horrible virus or something that's causing you to be in this condition then it's much easier to attract medical and social attention so we're constantly forcing people to view suffering as a, a medical disease to get help. Um, whereas really, we should be able to look at children in Sweden who are in a coma because they're in a horrible social situation and just say, she's in a horrible social situation, she needs help. You know, we shouldn't have to conceptualize it as a disease. And similarly, people under pressure in Havana should be able to say, hey, you know, this, this environment here is making me sick. What can we do to change it so I feel better? rather than sending people on a wild goose chase for a weapon that is, frankly, impossible. But those kind of narratives that experts put upon the sufferers is kind of how we perceive things. We need the headlines, we need answers, Mm. when sometimes there are just no answers. Um, Your third moment goes to Colombia for a really extraordinary example of this, another group experience, young women whose lives were really... Uh, 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 absolutely destroyed Mm -hmm. by what happened to them. Tell us, first of all, what happened to them. So so there's this little um, town in um, Colombia. It's sort of a mountain town that was, during when Colombia was a very violent place, it was a very violent place. Um, But Colombia had opened up, and it's now actually a really... The Maria Mountains in, in Colombia is actually a very nice place to live. But in December 2014, in a very overheated classroom, um, the windows didn't open, too many kids in the class, really, really hot, um, a girl collapses. Um, Not necessarily a terribly shocking thing in that environment. If you're prone to fainting, young women have low blood pressure, they faint. Um, Unfortunately, that spread and multiple girls in the class collapsed. That spread to a wider group in the... In that moment. In the, the, in the first instance, it was all in that one moment. Let's say, I've forgotten the number, but let's say 12 girls in the same class collapse. Um, huge. You can imagine the pandemonium, like ambulances being called, nobody knowing what to do, terribly stressful situation, rushing them to hospital. Next day, more girls collapse. Phenomenally, this spread all over this town until literally thousands of girls all over this town over the course of the next... Um, five years developed contagious seizures it just spread from school to school and these kids are having like multiple seizures a day and it just isn't stopping and you can imagine the sort of pandemonium that that caused and the stress with for the communities but what was particularly interesting for me so again these are type of seizures that as a medical uh, doctor a neurologist specializing in seizures i see these seizures all the time we call them dissociative seizures or non-epileptic seizures you know, it's, it's the second commonest reason for someone to collapse and have a seizure. The first commonest is epilepsy. The second commonest is dissociative seizures. And it's so common that if I've got 10 patients in hospital with seizures at any one time, at least three or four of them will have this. It's super common. Um, so I'm really familiar with this problem, and it's actually akin to what was happening in Havana syndrome. These people all had the same thing but they were manifesting it differently depending on how it started. If it started with a sound weapon, they got ear symptoms. If it started with a faint, they got fainting type symptoms, etc. But what was most fascinating is when I started looking at how these young women in Colombia were talked about compared, say, with the US diplomats in Havana. So they both had different symptoms, similar problem. In Colombia, it was all sort of like... Um, she needs a husband. Um, she needs more sex. She needs less sex. Oh, it's the stress. So oh, it's her dad is like this. So oh, it's her mother's like this. So oh, it's the poverty. Now, if you go to Havana Syndrome, you can read every single newspaper article that has ever been written about this, and you will not hear a single personal slur against any of those people. And it's not just because they're rich. It's because a lot of them are men. Um, if you compare these sort of outbreaks and it's young women, it's all about sort of boyfriends and um, kind That's of... hysteria. You no, know, exactly. Um, and when you look at sort of things about men, um, basically nobody even said 
anything. I mean, these diplomats must have lived in probably very stressful places, some of them by nature of the work that they did, and they were under stress in Havana. Um, I'm sure they had broken marriages. I'm sure they were going through difficult situations, but it wasn't even entertained um, because they were, they were a different group. Young women are treated very unfairly in this situation. And when you turned up in this little village in, in Colombia, nobody wanted to talk to you at first, and that's yeah. because of the press uh, attention on the, on the mm-hmm. issues, which had really destroyed these girls' lives even yeah. before you'd arrived to start talking to them. Yeah. Why, why did it destroy their lives? And wh- how did you manage to persuade them to talk to you? I mean, they were absolutely humiliated um, because they were being portrayed as sort of, you know, these sort of fragile, weak... These were intelligent, articulate girls... And their family, they were being, you know, it was all said because of the violence in Colombia. But, you know, they were making really legitimate arguments, which was we weren't the only ones present for the violence. Our parents were, our brothers were, but these were all girls. Everything that was said was so insulting to them. Um, and really, the, um, they were made exhibits in, 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 you know, you could see them on news programs, young girls kind of flailing around on the ground. It was very undignified. I mean, from my perspective, you know, they speak to me because I'm a neurologist, but, and I will have an expertise in this. But I have to say, I, I feel very conflicted about it even now because I, I'm a full-time doctor and when someone comes to me in clinic with this, I'm preparing to help them. But I didn't really have anything to, that I could offer these people other than to talk to them about my understanding of these disorders and to write differently about what they had but I still feel guilty about it because I still don't know what the right thing to do is is it to because the exposure can make these things worse am I contributing to the problem I honestly still don't know whether I did the right thing about writing about them but I tried to resolve my guilt about that by just asking them what do you want people to know and you know, what, what do you want to say? And they pretty much all wanted to say, you know, we're not going mad, we're not weak, we're intelligent, we're, you know, educated people, etc. We want to stop being portrayed as these sort of broken females. And being individuals again. I mean, yeah. when I Googled this, uh, the first thing I saw was the president of Colombia mm. on doing a press conference uh, saying that these girls had, it was all about the HPV. And well, some, something really scary happened in Colombia, actually, which is that, People, opportunists move into this town to make this about their own agenda. So opportunists from America, some of them were Colombian born, but mostly based in America, went to the town and told the community that the reason these girls were having seizures was because of HPV vaccine. Um, and basically this really caught on in the town. Again, we're in the same situation. If you're being told it's because you're, you, you need a husband and you're a weak stupid girl who has no education and doesn't can't handle her emotions or you've been poisoned by the HPV vaccine well the HPV vaccine is looking pretty attractive in that scenario so basically that totally took over the town and then people but once people kind of accepted that as an explanation they couldn't let go of it and once they couldn't get let go of it they couldn't get better and you can imagine what that's done for the HPV vaccine rates and the problem is the men who went into that town and sold that idea to them will be long gone when the cervical cancer outbreak happens in however many years time it was it was really, it was disgusting. And I, I, I had, bef- you know, I was hearing these stories like, you know, a man's coming from Poland and he's got a special machine that can cure us. I mean, if you live in an impoverished place like that, again, this is another part of my own guilt also. You know, you have these bloody people coming in saying, I'm an expert. And before I went, I sent them like, this is where I work. This is, you know, I'm safeguarded to work with children. I'm not allowed to work with patients. I have to, you know, have different checks done, etc. But you've got these people going into the town, feeding these vulnerable people all sorts of misinformation. And because they come from a country where they don't know, they haven't always had a good reason to trust the government or to trust official people. You know, they don't know who to trust. And a guy who comes from America looks pretty trustworthy compared to the politician who's phenomenally corrupt. So these people just didn't know who to trust, and it's a real mess. It's fascinating, this story, because it's kind of the other way around. There's the, all these girls, all of the same age, having this group mystery illness. Mm. They're all fainting together. They live in a place where culturally... Mm. 
there's not a lot of hope for them. But some mm -hmm. of them have already left to go to university. But what mm -hmm. happens to them imposes this narrative that takes away their voice, takes away their hope. Yeah. Their lives are literally trashed. Mm -hmm. But as a result of the illness. Yeah. So which comes first? The sort of socio-political environment that they're living in that they can't escape or the narrative that, that somehow the world puts on them? I think what happens is that you, you know, these things don't happen to anybody. They happen to people who are vulnerable. So I think, you know, they're in a very difficult situation. They're vulnerable people, really. And um, they come from a poor place that has had a lot of violence and that vulnerability will make you more liable to be caught up in one of these sort of outbreaks. Um, but, you know, the solution has to be what so often happens with these is, you know, they'll send one girl to a psychologist and the psychologist will ask her about her mom and dad and whatever. But, you know, it makes no sense if you've got if 10 people in this room catch an illness simultaneously. I've got to look at what's going on in this room, not ask you about your mom and dad. You know, there's, you know, it's the same with a virus or anything. You know, it's not about you. It's about something in this room that you all share. And I think what needed to happen with these girls is not individual psychological therapies because it wasn't about the individuals. It was about the group. And it was about the sociocultural kind of environment of that town. So we need social solutions is what I'm trying to say. We don't need girls to have to spend ages talking about their childhoods. We need social solutions to these problems. Yeah, and your last moment mm. tells that story really, really well. Um, you talk about the mosquito people. Yeah. Um, well, you tell the story about yeah. these extraordinary girls. So these are amazing. So the mosquito people are the indigenous people of Nicaragua and Honduras. They live on the mosquito coast. Very few indigenous people in, in Central America. And they're, so they're a very small proportion of the population of, of Nicaragua and Honduras. And they have what, what Western medical doctors would call a culture-bound illness. So an illness that is specific to the mosquito people. Um, and basically how it manifests is that first the affected person sees a vision. And the vision is usually of um, a devil of some sort. And they call the devil the duende. And they believe that the duende visits them to um, infect them. And that when they're infected by the duende, they lose... First, they have erratic behaviors. So they start running around manically. Um, and that villagers have to, have to um, tie them down. Because if they don't tie them down, they worry they'll run into the jungle or they'll run into the sea. And Crucially, uh, let's say that these are young women, mainly. Oh, these are, once again, young women. So very often, these are teenage girls. And they are... Um, and then they get these, like, madly frenetic seizures... Um, and they call this illness greasy sickness. I met the mosquito people, um, and, and you know they're very interesting people in lots of ways because they're indigenous people of Nicaragua, but they they believe very strongly in a Christian church, and so they have that sort of. I met them during that period when there was a long trail of immigrants coming up through Central America trying to get into the states, um, and it's so interesting to meet these people whose country is. There's so few indigenous people left. Has everyone forgotten how that came about? You know, that you know, there's just a tiny number of indigenous people live in this country. And they also their culture is so interesting because half of it's Spanish and you know, another bit of it is Christian kind of church from, from various places in Europe and they're a real mix of cultures. And uh, they call this illness mis um, greasy sickness. And they because it's caused by a devil, they treat it with traditional medicine. And that treatment is phenomenally successful. You they basically are you're doused in herbs, etc., and you recover. And it tends to happen in groups of girls. Um, what they get superhuman powers. I mean, this is oh. something like out of yeah. the films that we've all seen. This is, you know, I mean, it's kind of like not far off the omen or the well, exorcist or any of those things. Uh, and it's yeah. interesting just because of the cultural perception yeah. of that. So let's, let's talk about, you know, paint a picture of what's happening to these girls. They're being tied down yeah. by the people in their village so that they don't run off into the, vill in, mm. into the jungle. Yeah. Uh, they are tearing at their restraints. Yeah. So you'll have, I've seen videos of this, I've never seen it in person, but you see videos and you'll have like a young girl, teenage girl, and she's been like pinned down by six people. And they say that they, the, the affected girl gets super strength. So that's why they need to pin down the girl with so many people. They tie them to posts and things so they, they can't run away. It all looks terribly barbaric if you see it in videos. Um, 
And this is associated with their sexual awakening. Well, I mean, this is the thing is, you know, it's, it sounds right. So if you're not from a mosquito person and you don't believe in devils and duendes and you see a girl being tied down and having super strength, it all sounds like the very first time I heard about it, I referred to it as related to a superstition, which really, from my point of view, I, it took me a while to realize how ignorant that was because actually these people, this is actually, greasy sickness is a phenomenally sophisticated way that this community has learned to deal with a specific social problem. So they have a problem within this community of young girls being sexualized at an early age in an incredibly Christian community. So these girls are in a really conflicted situation because they're getting sexual advances from older men, but they're also expected to live extremely Christian um, and decent lives. They're in a difficult situation. They're uncomfortable with the situation in which they find themselves. Now, what we'd all love to think we can do is that we can go to someone and go, hello, I'm uncomfortable with the situation in which I find myself. But you know what? We're not all that eloquent. And we're also not all that, you know, we don't all find our parents approachable in these matters. Or, you know, it's not easy always to verbalize in a highly eloquent way what's bothering you. So what happens with these young women when they find themselves in this difficult situation is that it is kind of um, presented as this illness, greasy sickness. They develop greasy sickness, which is a culturally understood disorder. So the community know what the problem is, and they deal with it by the community coming together to support the girl with the traditional healing, and that makes her better. And they have sort of removed her from the stressful situation without anyone having to have the conversation that nobody wants to have. So it's essentially a way for a girl to say, listen, I'm stressed about something. I'm having difficulty talking about it. I need extra support. It gets you the support you need and you get better. Now, the thing about the symptoms that's strange for me is that I don't find any of the symptoms strange. Because I have, people bring me videos in London, I work in London, um, of their seizures and they look exactly the same. And you know what, if you see a family in London restraining their um, loved one who's having a dissociative seizure, it looks exactly like greasy sickness. I thought they were just this, very similar things. But what's most interesting is that the patients in, my, in the communities that I work with, if you get this, they don't call it greasy sickness, but they... If you get these seizures in London, expect to be ostracized from your community. Expect to have to hide at home because you're embarrassed about what's happening to you. Expect to not be able to explain to people what's happening to you because people will say, oh, she's gone a bit mad. Um, so the total opposite things happen. Greasy sickness and mosquito community gets you community support and you get better. Exactly the same thing happening in Western medical culture will see you pathologized and possibly disabled for the rest of your life. Greasy sickness is, is a mosquito word, and its literal translation is crazy sickness. So what these people are getting in mosquito terms is a thing called crazy sickness. Now imagine being diagnosed with crazy sickness here. You, you know, it, that you will not be telling your neighbor or your boss that diagnosis. But in, in the mosquito people, there's no stigma attached to this because they have attributed this disorder to the duende, which is something external to themselves. It's not a personal thing. It's not about you or your fragility. It's about something external has happened that is causing your body to react in this way, and now we need to support you to get better. So when I called greasy sickness a superstition, it was really hugely ignorant on my part, because what it was actually was a hugely sophisticated cultural way of giving people support to get better, which, quite frankly, in London, I'm doing very badly because these seizures only have a 30% cure rate in London, 100% cure rate in the mosquito community, and that is something I really need to learn from. And that's pretty much the kind of the conclusion of your journey, isn't yeah. it? You're very humble about that. You realise that it is the Western uh, superiority uh, of medicine, um, of understanding medical conditions yeah. that needs to be rethought. And, you know, that's really what I want to take to the audience, have a, have a think about. Your takeout is really, as a neurologist, uh, 
how do you, you are understanding people's symptoms within your cultural values, within your medical cultural mm. values. Um, I'm sure there are plenty of people here who don't necessarily believe everything the doctor says. I will always go to an osteopath and a homeopath first, and I'm always shocked by the, the way that the doctors mm. um, will sum up my symptoms if I have to go there. Um, but that's really your takeout, isn't it? Yeah. That uh, you're really rethinking everything that you've ever done. Of course, there are aspects of medicine where Western medicine is clearly superior. You know, you want childbirth, you want to, you know, you've got a much better chance of surviving, you know, your cancer treatment, your sophisticated operations. But I don't think we can assume uh, um, our Western kind of medical way of working is superior in every aspect. And I think what's useful for people to realize is that when it comes to sort of psychological illness in particular, um, all research on, for psychological conditions are done on westernized, educated, industrialized, rich countries. And that means that the vast majority of the world is not represented in that research. But we are very keen in journal, medical journals, etc., to foist our view of, of psychological illnesses on others. So I'll often see you know, a, a heading in a journal that will say, you know, Hispanic men in X you know, town you know, or will not admit they have depression. Well, do you know what? Maybe they don't have depression according to how they explain how a person feels. What they have is something which they define by their situation, not by neurotransmitters, but we love defining by neurotransmitters, etc. cetera. Um, you know, so we've, we need to sort of realize that other cultures actually, particularly when it comes to psychological things, may very well be doing things way better than us by considering things in a sociocultural or situational, in more holistic way. Because we love to just explain everything with chemicals and neurotransmitters. And that has a way of actually creating chronic illness. If I think there's something wrong with the chemicals in my brain, you know, that sort of has, that, that feels out of my control. Yeah. If I think there's something wrong with my life situation, that should be in my control. So how we conceptualize our suffering affects recovery. Yeah. Where does that leave the children in Sweden? Um, we've seen the, the same mystery illnesses uh, spreading through Lesbos, through the refugee yeah. camps in Lesbos, uh, Nauru, as you said. Mm. Uh, it, it's, it's increasing as despair continues mm. to build. Um, wh wh how does that understanding leave us about the children? I think that basically the children's situation hasn't moved forward because people, s the, the, you know, the world is be becoming less accommodating to asylum seekers, not more. You know, Sweden is a fantastic country, you know, but it, it's even become more hostile in recent times. Um, and this is spreading around the world now because it's a recognized way. It's, it gives people a voice because you know what? Until you wash up on a beach, you know, nobody cares whether you're in a boat um, coming across any sea. Um, and this, this gives people a voice and will continue to give them a voice. And I'm fine with that yeah. until we find a social solution. Yeah, brilliant. We've got 10 minutes to take your questions. Who would like to start? Yes. Oh, hang on. And do wait until the microphone comes to you, please. Uh, hi. Uh, at the end of the book, you tell a story about a young woman who comes to see you on her own. Mm. Um, and it, so th all of the stories you've just told now mm. are kind of socially... I don't know if it's socially constructed illnesses, yeah. but there's a social element to them, but they're contagions. Mm. What about young women who are suffering kind of stress or something on mm. their own? Uh, so you... you is, is that... And is that... Does it manifest itself differently in our culture? Do we yeah. have these in the UK or is it people on their own? How do we know if somebody manifests these that mm. this is a helpful way of talking to them about what yeah. they're going yeah. through? I mean, it's, that, it's super important. So when I started writing this book, I want to make it absolutely clear. This is not a book about others. Weird stuff happening to other people. Um, if you think that if, if these people have what we call cultural kind of um, cultural idioms of distress or culturally defined ways of expressing distress and asking for help, I mean, do we think we don't have them? Of course we have them. But when they're within your own community, you don't recognize them. So, you know, we have just as many. But ours are, so in another community, it might be defined by your spiritual beliefs. Um, or it may be there were people in Kazakhstan who, who were under sort of lots of uh, political pressure, and they might be defined by the political pressure. Our cultural idioms of distress, I think, are very often produced 
through the medical um, medical system because you know we're losing our caring institutions and we're individualistic societies we get less kind of support from our families so a good way of expressing distress and getting help is to have a medical problem because then you have someone to go to um, and we are doing this you know I see huge numbers of people with psychosomatic conditions and they're manifesting as um, tiredness headaches seizures withdrawal and yeah, and also medical society. You know, I think we kind of think medical um, diagnoses are absolutes, right? You know, they are absolutely not. Hardly anything is an absolute. Like, what's normal blood pressure? Well, it's it's different probably in one community to another community. What's a normal weight? It's not the same in Los Angeles as in Samoa. You know, so it is within my power as a doctor. I can create an illness tomorrow. I can decide tomorrow that basically, you know, someone with you know, a hairline here instead of here has a particular illness. And if I'm, if I'm sufficiently dynamic in my description of that and, and people are sort of um, caught up in my um, narrative, I can create an illness and it will spread around the room. Thing. And I don't want to start naming illnesses now that I think are entirely culturally defined because if I do that, there will be people in the room who have it. Yeah. And I don't want to sort of... Um, create a situation in which people are then suddenly worried and I'm not giving you a support system for it. But I can tell you now that particularly when it comes to young women, and I think it happens to young women because young women have a lot more bodily changes happening. I see a lot more people with seizures in young women because young women have blood, low blood pressure, normal, healthy thing, but can cause you to faint and collapse, which can be pathologized. Um, young women have these cyclical hormones, which means their bodies are changing all the time. Also, young women have less of a voice. And I see huge numbers of young women who are probably suffering in a, in a, in a social context, but who are going to medical doctors with a variety of diagnoses that didn't exist 10 years ago. If you have a diagnosis that didn't exist 10 years ago and has no really reliable diagnostic um, measure and no proper treatment... Um, which means it's just you've been given a diagnosis and now you're stuck with it for the rest of your life, then ask yourself, if I've got something that's not being made better by my label, should I just look at things in my life and see is there something I can do to make myself better yeah. rather than taking on this label? Yeah. Have we got time for one more question, yeah, James? a couple more, great. I think. A yeah. couple more, great. Thank you. Hi, hi, Suzanne. Uh, my name is Jane, and I want to thank you. I've read all of your books. My job is an occupational health doctor, okay. and my cohort is NHS staff. So your books have really helped me have those quite difficult conversations. Thank you. Uh, because if there's anybody who firmly believes in the medical model, it's medical people. Mm. And there's an awful lot of functional neurological disorder and mm. non-epileptic seizures out there. So please, please, please don't mm. stop writing. Mm. Thank you. Because you're helping change people like me um, and our practice. So the question I want to ask you... Um, I'm a little bit fearful. Should I, should I ask you if your clinics are going to be full of long COVID in a couple of years? Mm. But I also want to ask you, um, has the Home Office asked you to come and talk to them? Because I think mm. we've got a, I live near Dover. Mm. We see endless asylum seekers coming mm. across on their little boats. Are we, are we, are we brewing a problem? Yeah. Mm. Thank you. Good question. Okay. Um, I'm not an expert in asylum um, issues. So, you know, I, I, I feel just as a, as a human being living in the world, I, I feel like we should open borders and worry um, less about suddenly being overrun with um, people. We, need, we actually need more people, not less people. Um, so I, I'm not going to pretend to be any sort of asylum expert. I'm going to say something about long COVID, which some people might find hard to hear. I think that basically... I remember in March 2020, um, you know, I was a doctor working in a hospital. I haven't done general medicine for a long time. I do neurology. So it's a long time since I've seen someone in respiratory failure or worked in intensive care unit. And when COVID started coming in, it was just terrifying for us. We were hearing stories about doctors in, 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 um, in Italy who were, you know, one minute they were looking after people, next minute they were the intensive care patients. It was terrifying. And then you've got the government and you've got the, you know, we've all been through it, the counting down the deaths. And then there's, the, you know, how many people died today? How many people died today? And then it was sort of, here are the things to look out for. Now, quite frankly, this is just like being in an embassy in Havana 
being told you're being attacked by a sonic weapon. I took my own temperature like several times a day in, the, I'd say, the first two or three weeks, convinced that I had a high temperature, and I never had. And I was fortunate that I was able to kind of self-soothe. I eventually was able to say, you know, do you know what? You don't have it. You know, get on with it. You know, and then I felt kind of better. And I, what I was doing was searching my body for symptoms and signs that I was dying. And, um, and it, you know, if you didn't do that, well, you know, God bless you. I mean, I can't believe that <laughs> there's many who didn't. Um, it is absolutely inevitable that there will be people who searched for signs of COVID, um, tested negative, but still absolutely believed they had COVID. And then we get what I described earlier, you know, new symptoms that when you, when you have an illness that comes along and people are suffering, people will say, well, could this be why I've been suffering? So you get a bigger and bigger group saying, um, I've got these symptoms. Do you have these symptoms? Oh, you have those symptoms. Well, maybe you also have it. Testing became irrelevant because people just know that some tests are false negative. So unfortunately, long COVID is, is unequivocally a group of people, some of whom were very sick with COVID and clearly have end organ damage, some of whom very clearly have a kind of post-viral syndrome, which we all have known for a very long time exists, but absolutely some of whom have been affected by what happens to a person when they're asked to search their body for a deadly illness and they're in a terrifying situation. But unfortunately, what makes me sick to the back teeth, quite frankly, is when I listen to news programs and all they talk about are the first two groups because we're straight back into a Havana syndrome. We're not allowed to talk about the third group because the, everyone thinks that third group are a bunch of idiots, but they're not. They're human beings with a mind-body interaction that affects all of us. Absolutely unequivocally, a percentage of people with long COVID have mostly a psychosomatic condition caused by the horrible thing that we've been through. But until news stations start actually saying that out loud, those people will continue to look for their own personal sonic weapon. Someone needs to just say it out loud. Thank you very much. Susanna Sullivan. Thanks for listening. You can read the transcript at jillysmith.com, where you can also sign up to my newsletter. And you can follow me on Instagram. I'm at foodjillysmith, where you can keep up with all my adventures in cookery with Lisa online too. Check the show notes and on Instagram for full details of how to get Cookie the Books discounts on Lisa's cookery courses. And next week, we're back on food after our summer break with Jenny Ridgewell's hilarious account of being a cookery teacher in a London comprehensive in the 1970s.